So our next speaker is Valerie Garcia from Remax Integra in Toronto, Canada. I just got to spend a little bit of time with Valerie in Rome at the Remax Europe conference, and it was a thing to behold. We saw, we, we saw all the photos. I do put my pictures on the internet. Um, in addition to uh, sharing a hotel room with Valerie, which I can vouch that she is a good human being for five days straight, and that's not, that's, that's not an easy thing to accomplish, um, she was dazzling the European realtors. She explained to them what buyer's agency was. They had never heard of it. They do not have it. And she was breaking it down. And I was like, learning, and I'm a buyer's agent, so that was weird. <laughs> anyway, welcome, Valerie. Come on up and tell these people what's up. Hi. Hi, Val. Is this one working? Okay, great. So um, I was at the original Genuine Hustle. Yay. Yeah, right, Georgia Dome. And um, so when I said, I am definitely coming to this one, Anna Marguerite said, okay, we would love for you to kind of wrap up and talk about implementation and why, why everybody in the room is going to struggle with doing all the things that you wrote down on your 30 pages of notes today. And I've been teaching in real estate for 18 years, and you know that sounded like a fairly easy thing to do until I actually sat down and started looking at why it is we aren't going to do any of the things that we put on our, our notes. Um, and I realized that it's kind of a, a big thing, something we don't really talk about very much. It's not very comfortable. It's mostly fear. And so um, I said to Anna Marguerite that today I wanted to talk about fear. And then as soon as I said that, I was like instantly scared to death. Like, oh my god. That was the worst idea I've ever had. And so um, as I'm finishing writing this, I thought, well, I'm just going to be really honest and throw this subtitle up here because it's not really facing your fears and serving your community. It's really being a scared to death hot mess and showing up anyway. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. And then thankfully, I'm not the last speaker. I'm sure someone much smarter than me is going to come up and wrap up the day for you. Um, so what I wanted to um, really talk to you about, though, is, is the word service. And we are going to talk a little bit about this word first and foremost. And I was really raised to believe that serving people is the highest calling that we can have on this earth. And I didn't really realize until I got older, um, not wiser, but older, that um, not everybody was raised that way. And I didn't actually realize until I got older that some people are raised to only think about themselves and what's in it for me. And what was interesting is I didn't actually really realize that until I started working in real estate. And, um, and that's okay because that is a, a big chunk of the world. And that was a very good on-the-job education for me. But um, with this re when this really hit home for me, oops, one step too far. You can laugh in the second when that comes up again. Um, <laughs> when this really hit home for me was grade 11. Now, giving you a little bit of background on me, I am the second of 15 children. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we'll go through the whole thing. No twins, same parents, no, not Mormon, not Catholic, not Irish, not Amish. Those are usually all the questions. Um, yeah, yeah, no TV. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Um, <laughs> My fifth grade science teacher explained it to me in great detail. That was really embarrassing. Um, but when I was in grade 11, I grew up in a really small town. Um, I grew up in a town of 4,000 people, so literally you knew everyone, and everyone knew you and was all up in your business. Um, but when I was in grade 11, I was working three jobs, in addition to obviously going to high school. Um, and one of my jobs was working at um, a dishwasher at the only restaurant in town. So picture this town. one. Stop sign, one bank, one grocery store, one restaurant, one hardware store. One of my siblings worked at every single one of those. Um, but my job was dishwasher at the local restaurant. It was dirty, it was disgusting, it was the kind of job that really nobody else wanted, but uh, that's what I did. So three days a week, I left school at the end of the day, and I went to the library after school for two hours, and I did my schoolwork, and um, didn't surf the internet, because there wasn't any back then, which is unfortunate. I read books, and, um, and then after the library closed, I walked across the street to the restaurant, and I worked there from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., three nights a week, 
Um, I wash dishes, I stocked the salad bar, I peeled vegetables, um, I washed all of the potatoes that became baked potatoes. You might not know when you eat those out of the little paper foil um, wrappers that they have to be washed first. That's a back-breaking job for a grade 11 student. Um, and um, that was my job, three nights a week, and I earned $5.15 an hour. After taxes, I brought home roughly about $55 a week. And um, for me, this was not a perk. This, um, this kind of job was not, um, wasn't, wasn't something that I did because I wanted to. I grew up in a really big family, and this was a necessity. We had to earn our own spending money. We had to earn our own way. And um, most of my friends obviously were not working three jobs at that point. Most of them were dating and going to homecoming, and they were cheerleaders, and they were doing whatever teenagers did in the 90s, like go to the roller rink. And, um, and I, that wasn't me. That, that wasn't my role, and that wasn't my childhood. Um, I was washing dishes at night. I was babysitting on the weekends. And then every Saturday morning, I was manning, womaning, the customer service desk at the local bank. And it never really occurred to me during all of that time to be ashamed of what I did. It never really occurred to me um, that any of those roles that I was playing was something to be ashamed of. Until one day at school, I heard a couple of kids in the lunchroom talking about me behind my back and talking about all of these things that I did in the community. Um, and in that moment, I was suddenly looking at myself through their eyes. I was realizing that to them, it wasn't just some chick who like, spent a lot of time at the library. I was the person who bussed their tables and washed their dishes and babysat their cousins and served their parents at the bank. I served them. That's how they saw me. I was a servant to most of the town. And that was the first time I really realized that service wasn't always viewed as an honorable thing. Um, so one of the things I, I really enjoy, and you're going to see a bit of this today, is definitions. I think defining things is really important. And the definition of service is the action of helping or doing something for someone. Service is about them, not about you. Service is about helping people with their needs. It's about seeing what needs to be done and doing it. That's how I was taught, and that's what I lived. And when I heard those kids talking about me that day, it suddenly made me feel like maybe I was doing it all wrong. Like maybe in order to be more or successful or liked or better, that I needed to start being more about me than about them. And maybe I really had been doing it all wrong up to that point. And that scared me. See, this is where it comes apart for most of us in our lives, is that most of us actually do start out with a heart for service. We start out as people who like to wrap up the things that we already own in pretty paper and give it to our siblings for their birthdays because we want to make sure that we're giving them presents too. We are the kids who pick flowers and hand them to our mother and act like it's a really big deal. And um, we share ice cream because it makes somebody else feel joy. As children, as young people, service is in our DNA. This is who we are. But Something then usually happens in our life, like it happened to me in a grade 11, where we start to feel like service is a dirty word. Like it's something that's beneath us and we really should be looking out for ourselves more. And so we start to go around feeling scared all the time. Because when you only think about yourself, that's a really scary place to live. And we start to look at ourselves with criticism. And we start to say, I look terrible in that picture, or I don't like this about myself, or I sound horrible on camera. And we worry about what other people are going to think, and at the same time, here's the best part, we're walking around telling ourselves and everybody around us to be authentic. So let's talk about this word for a minute. This has got to be one of the greatest buzzwords of our time. You want to talk about drinking games at conferences? Like, this one is the middle square of every bingo game. Right? I don't care where you are, what conference, this is it. Bingo, right here. So the definition of authenticity is simply being real or true. When you search the word authenticity, these are the words that come up. Reliable, dependability, trustworthiness, credibility, and truth. It's funny that authenticity has actually kind of gotten to be a dirty word in the online space, too. Is it who we really are? Is it who we really want others to think we are? What is it? What does it mean? 
Gurus a lot of times throw this word around like it's something that we can just create ourselves to be. You should just go out there and make yourself authentic. That's not really how it works. I would suggest to you that authenticity is really just the grown-up word for service. It's about caring more about other people than yourself. It's about caring enough even when it's really uncomfortable, whether it's giving feedback or understanding or curiosity or giving somebody grace. It's about being somebody that other people can rely on or they can trust to do what needs to be done. That's authenticity, but when you break it down, that's really just service. It's really just being who other people can rely on to help them. But see, now we're going to be back at that scary place again because when we have to think about other people, instead of just thinking about ourselves, it's scary. It means that nobody's looking out for us. We're always going to think about them. What about us? And that's ingrained in us from a really, really young age. Now, when I first started working in real estate, my broker, to this day, became one of the greatest mentors of my life. He was an amazing man, and, and he is the reason why I teach the way I do today, because I saw his passion for teaching and for helping new agents who had absolutely no idea what they were doing. Brand new baby agents who came in and said, I, I passed my test, what now? Well, they actually don't teach you anything when you take your test, right? You know that. So you're still brand new. And one of the things that he taught me, he told me this secret that has stayed with me for 18 years. And the story of how I came by hearing this secret was basically one day I made a really smart aleck comment, which for those of you who know me know it's totally out of character. Um, and he pulled me into his office and he was kind of reprimanding me and he said something to me that has stood with me all of this time. And I'm gonna tell you that secret today. Every single one of us, every one of us, every one of you, we walk around scared all the time. We're scared of doing something wrong. We're scared of losing a deal. We're scared of losing a client. We're scared of losing a friend. We're scared of missing an opportunity. Patrick Lencioni does a great session on this. He talks about naked leadership, about the ability that we have to actually get in a room with our people and take all of our clothes off, not literally, <laughs> metaphorically, and, and be willing to say, look, this is who I am. See me. But we're scared. Most of the time when we talk from this stage, the first comments or the first questions that come from the audience, and I do it too, is, yeah, but what if? Because we immediately go to, well, what if something, like, what if, what if how, how can you do that? What if it doesn't work? What if it all goes wrong? What if it doesn't? We're afraid to be vanilla, but we're also afraid to be the extra scoop of full fat, chunky monkey that we are. We're constantly, consistently, always in a state of fear. Now, learning that secret really helped me become the teacher that I am today. It made me understand that I need to have empathy and that I need to meet people where they're at. But there is a second part to that secret, and it took me a long time to learn it. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. It's that we're powerful beyond measure. Our biggest fear is that we are awesome freaking rock stars. Because if we're awesome freaking rock stars, do you know what that means? It means that we have the power and the responsibility to do something with it. If we admit that we are freaking kick ass, then we know that we are put here because we are meant to do something about it. And one of my favorite quotes of all time is, your playing small does not serve the world. And there's that word again. Serving other people is rarely convenient. It's not easy. It's often at odds with the easy path. It's occasionally not at all what other people agree with. It's usually, almost always, the road less traveled. But if we serve with authenticity, then we are very likely doing exactly what we were created to do. And it's very, very, very likely that we are going to find our true calling in the middle of it. You see, we're all created to do really big things in our communities and in our lives and our families and our sphere of influence. 
We're all created to do really big things. But first, you have to believe that you can. And then you have to be brave enough to do something about it. But the good news is, as you've heard a bunch of times today, we're not created to do all that alone. We've spoken a lot about community today. It's maybe the be best conference theme of all time, agreed? And you know, the definition of community is a group of people living in the same place. And I have to tell you, this is where I break up with the Oxford English Dictionary because I'm calling BS on that definition. My group of people is spread all over the place. My community is not all living in one place. And for most of you, most of us in this room, your community, it's everywhere. It's not just the people that live around you. And rarely, if you're like me and you're unlucky, most of your community is hardly ever all in the same place. But community is also defined as this, joint ownership. Now this one speaks to me. This one I can get behind. An equal responsibility to each other. Community simply means we're all in this together. And we all come to the table with the same opportunities and responsibility to serve. And now I know what you're thinking at this point. You're thinking, Val, I came here to this conference not to hear a really nice, warm and fuzzy speech about truth and authenticity and fear. I'm really here to implement, so give me something I can write down on my notepad and wrap it all up. And so I'm gonna try and give you a big fat takeaway, but it's, I'm warning you, you're going to be also warm and fuzzy. I have one more word for you, and this word is try. It's a small word, but it's a powerful one. I think back to that very first time that I was made to feel ashamed of serving other people. I remember the fear that followed in the many years since. I can recall dozens and dozens of times when I have felt afraid to speak out. I have been afraid to be part of a joint ownership or to be authentic in my life or my career. And I'm sure that each and every one of you can think of those times those times when it was easier and simpler to just focus on yourself. When stuff is hard and it's going wrong, when it doesn't just rain, it pours. When our business is struggling, our relationship is a hot mess, our bills are unpaid, our kids are growing up to be heathens. <laughs> Everything is just hard. And often when that happens, our response is to circle the wagons, board the windows, and keep it all to ourselves. This is our standard response as adults. We're just gonna keep it all in, we're gonna plug the holes, we're gonna keep the you know, damage to a minimum, we're not gonna talk about it, we're gonna board up the windows, pull the blinds, and we're gonna just figure it out. And then most of the time, we emerge from that season of our lives when the worst is over. We'll engage with others when the pain is past and we can kind of see the finish line and the scab is healing and the resolution is in sight and we're mostly fun to be around again. At that point, we can be triumphant and authentic again. But the real story for all of us and for our joint ownership is in the try. Something really powerful and important happens in that process. It's the messy middle part where the end is not in sight and the resolution is not guaranteed. The try is when you have to get out of bed every morning, even when you don't want to. The try is when all you can do is the next thing you can do. And there is something really real in that moment, in the messy, dirty, real, painful, struggling, hard middle part that is getting you to the finish line. That's the real story. That's the authenticity. And that is just plain effing scary to talk about with your joint ownership. But this is where service really happens. When we face the fear of not knowing what other people are gonna say and make the decision to serve anyway. So the question I'm gonna leave you with today is this. Do you wanna have a real impact in your community, in your joint ownership? And I know for all of you the answer is yes, and that's why you're here today. 
So in order to do that, you've got to find ways to be able to talk about the try. You have to find ways to applaud the messy middle. You're not just in it, your joint ownership is in it too. Everybody, at some point, is in the try. And we have to find ways to allow other people around us to realize that authenticity and service doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be real. Make videos, send emails, start a movement, but don't hide out until you think you've got it figured out. Playing small doesn't serve your world. Start conversations that mean something, even when you don't have all the answers. Take a stand for something that you're passionate about. Gather a joint ownership of similarly passionate people. Don't wait until you have it all figured out to feel like you have something to share. Share what you know and where you are right now. Then keep sharing as you learn and use that to teach the people around you. And understand that everyone around you is scared. But we're only scared until we realize that we are meant to do really big things and that we are meant to do it together. And acknowledge that try is a valid and beautiful part of the process. And I'm gonna speak for each of the speakers who got on this stage today, every single one of them amazing and people that I absolutely adore and respect. Everybody today has shared a little bit of their story, but they've all also shared with you a little bit of their try. Because I guarantee you that not one of us, not a single one of us who has stood on this stage in front of you today has got it all figured out. We're all in the middle of a really messy try and it all looks different, but we're all in it. Not one of us is here to stand on the stage to say, look at me, I figured it out, I'm amazing. We're amazing, but we're still like a mess. <laughs> but we are serving our joint ownerships with as much authenticity and fear as the next person. And so that brings us back to where we started today. It all comes back to this word. We're in it together. This industry, this is our joint ownership. This world, this planet, our communities, we are all a joint ownership. So I'm gonna leave you with one last thought from the great Dr. King. And I love this one. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. So don't be afraid to serve. Don't be afraid to be real. It's the only true way for all of us to be truly great. Thank you.